Welcome back in to Eastern Pan Am Talk with Mike Hornby. Tuesday edition, uh, I am joined by John Gilstrap and Mike Height. Welcome back, guys. Nice Good to be here. And we are now joined by another delegate, um, Delegate Adam Burkhammer, the Bulldog. Adam, can you hear us? Yeah, guys. How's it going this morning? Doing very well. Um, Adam, can you, you've been working, um, maybe you can just give us a little bit of background. You, you, you were heavily involved in the, the foster care system within West Virginia, correct? Yeah, yeah. So first, I apologize. My, uh, my voice is a little rough this morning. You know, everybody's got to love a good summertime cold, so I do apologize for that. We're but, looking uh, at your, your, your picture. Your hair is a little, uh, little uh, skew rough, too. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping I can update that picture next year to, to better uh, show my uh, uh, good hairstyle. <laughs> You're partying it on the other side now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, uh, but no, um, Mike, you're exactly right. I'm uh, uh, heavily involved in child welfare foster care. So that kind of started on the personal side. My wife and I opened our home in 2020 to become foster parents. We've, uh, 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 we're blessed to be able to adopt our first placement. So little Josie with us um, that's uh, always been ours um, uh, is uh, still part of the family there. We've continued to foster then. So Currently, right now, we have uh, three foster children additionally in our home. So, uh, uh, two biological children, one um, adopted child, and now three foster kids. So, it's a lively time in the Burkhammer house. <laughs> and so, that, that's where I got started in the child welfare and came into the legislature and uh, knew that the child welfare system and the foster care system was in, uh, in, in kind of dire shape here. You know, we've got 6,200 kids coming in the, you know, in the system right now. We have the highest rate of kids coming in the system in the country. Percentage-wise, uh, correct? Not actual per, number. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Per, per capita. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Percentage-wise. So, um, so we've obviously got a lot of problems there and um, began to look around and it's just such a complex uh, system that uh, a lot of people don't know where to start. And so I decided I was going to start somewhere. I was going to learn the system inside and out, learn how it worked, learn the good, learn the bad, and uh, try to do the best I can. So, um, yeah, so give us give us long. a little bit of, you've been there, I think, three terms. What have we done as a legislature over the last uh, few years that has been positive, and what are we working for for the future? Yeah, so the uh, last couple of years, um, I, I don't think we did a whole lot. Um, I think it's it's one of those systems. It's nobody knew really where to start at, and so we we tried a couple of things um, here and there, but nothing was really uh, taking root and getting through both bodies. But I will say, in uh, the 24 session, we did pass House Bill 4975, and that is a communication portal um, that is going to bring in better communication, uh, which ultimately will bring better care to kids throughout the foster care system. And uh, that uh, that's going to roll out over the, the next year and then actually final implementation over two years. And that's a lot longer than I want and other people want, but we want to make sure we're getting this right. So that system is going to bring everybody together because um, you got to realize how many people are involved in this case when you think it's not just CPS. Um, there's uh, the prosecuting attorney's office. There are uh, the, the entire court system and, and everything that goes on there. You have a guardian ad litem, which is an appointed attorney. You've got foster families. You've got kinship families. You have, you have mom and dad, biological families. So this system gets really complex and needs a, a good streamline of communication uh, throughout the process. And we just currently don't have, have that. Right now, you're, sometimes you're getting text messages. Sometimes you're making phone calls. Sometimes you're making emails. I know folks that are even using Facebook Messenger, uh, they've got group messages together. So really just want to streamline that communication, streamline information. And uh, I believe that that ultimately gives everybody uh, real-time information, real-time data so that they can truly make decisions on the best interest of the child. John? If, so, we, could, if we could wave... Excuse me. If we would wave a magic wand and just eliminate the whole problem of the opioid epidemic, would we pretty much eliminate the foster care issue? You're absolutely right. I think that is our number one issue facing the state. And it's another very complex issue that I don't think we're doing enough on. 
And uh, but I'm not criticizing everybody else because I'm not sure where we start at either. But when you talk about um, uh, corrections issues that's that's uh, around drug addiction and substance abuse, when we talk about educational issues and behavioral issues in our schools, that's substance abuse and, and drug addiction issues. Uh, when we talk about uh, the foster care system, it, it's drug abuse and uh, you know substance use disorder there. So. I, I believe you're exactly right. If that, if we could fix that issue with the, the magic wand, I think it really turns the state around on a lot of issues. Mr. Height. Good morning, Adam. So there's Mr. a. Height, how a, are you, this morning? I'm doing well. There's a uh, out of session joint uh, Senate House committee that you're heading up um, um, this summer. Um, talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing in that committee and uh, what you hope to get accomplished. Yeah, so uh, first I want to appreciate uh, you, um, Delegate Hype, for joining us uh, on that committee. So uh, I went to the speaker last summer and I said, hey, I, I really want to dive a little deeper into this, but I, I need. Uh, I need our leadership's backing. I need some staff. And uh, and so we started some stuff last fall, but really this year we took off because I realized we needed it to be both House and Senate, not just House. So we've got some really good support coming out of the House. Uh, Senator Rucker is uh, working with us. Uh, Senator Deeds out of Greenbrier County. Uh, so we're just trying to dive into every element of it. So we've been bringing in experts uh, to come in, and, and I'm going to use the word testify, but it's not necessarily under oath, but we're giving them the opportunity to come in, share their side of the child welfare system, the good, the bad, and, and how we can help. And that's everything from the courts to the uh, child placing agencies that are part of it. Also, you know, obviously, our Department of Human Services is part of that conversation. And so, again, we're just trying to... Uh, take one bite at a time at this big elephant and uh and that it's a complex system a lot of moving parts so we've got to learn what's going on in each little element because you can change something in one area and if you're not careful it, it'll mess three things up in another area so that's why you got to have all these stakeholders coming together so uh what we're trying to do there uh one thing we've got to do a, a better job at is prevention how do we turn off the faucet coming into child welfare we can have the best system that we uh, you know, across the country, we can have the best processes, the best policies, but if we are still have this floodgate open on the front end, I think we've still got a problem. So we are looking at preventative services, and uh, I think those things are going to be generational. Uh, you know, there, there's not a short-term solution to turning that faucet off, but we've got to look at, at long-term uh, dealing with substance abuse better, uh, better equipping folks coming out of school, potentially using the education system to equip parents to understand how to care for children. Uh, and, and, and as well, we've got some economic things that we need to do here. Uh, some of the things that are driving child welfare are also related to poverty. And uh, we've got to make sure we're dealing with, with those things as well. So number one is prevention, turn off the faucet. The other thing we've really got to do, and, and I think we've all watched a lot of the news lately, we've got to bring some transparency to the system here. Uh, you cannot fix uh, problems uh, behind closed doors, um, and so we've got to bring some transparency forth uh, to the forefront uh, of child welfare. So that's across all agencies. Everybody's got to work together. We've got to be transparent. Where is it lacking? Where is the transparency lacking? Um, I, I think that transparency is lacking uh, uh, within government. I think when we look across uh, state and federal government at times, we can see that uh, sometimes those folks kind of like to buckle down and in, like uh, uh, they, they don't want to own some mistakes. They, they don't, they, they want to maybe pass blame around. And so um, we, we've got to, got to start kind of within our own government, within the system and, uh, and be transparent when we fail and uh, be transparent on how we're going to fix those things. You know, and I think uh, sometimes people don't realize that this is um, many times where the legislation comes from, that these these uh, out-of-session committees uh, sort of dive down into the heart of, of problems and try to come up with solutions and legislation um, for the next session and, and sort of fine-tune it and, you know, 
by bringing in uh, agencies and having them testify as to uh, the roadblocks that they may have uh, and having stakeholders come in and talk about the roadblocks that they have, um, it helps to fine-tune le legislation um, in a way that you just don't have during the regular session. You're so busy with so many bills and trying to get things passed that this is where uh, a lot of legislation comes from, um, is these committees and, and fine-tuning. So uh, kudos to, to Adam for, for heading this uh, committee up. And I think you have, what, two or three uh, different pieces of legislation we're working on in that committee right now. Is that correct? Yeah, yep. Yeah. So uh, I, I just want to make sure everybody knows, um, you know, these are volunteer type committees as well. So Delegate Heights, uh, you know, he's not, he's sometimes joining uh, via Zoom teams type virtual, but then uh, our last meeting, you know, he made the trip all the way to Charleston to be with us. And so, um, but all volunteer basis, but you're exactly right. This is when we can get into the details and we can really kind of grind things out. So, uh, also, uh, kudos to you. Appreciate your time and commitment uh, to wanting to uh, help kids and, and help the system here. And uh, so, definitely uh, appreciate. Uh, so, Adam, what what well. uh, what potential legislation has this committee already identified that, or, or if you have, do you have some ideas or, or legislation that you are, you want to promote? Yeah, so again, kind of around transparency um, and uh, other states are doing a little bit better job when there is a, uh, a fatality or what they define as a near fatality. And so of a we, child you know, in, in child care and in uh, foster care? Yeah, in child welfare. And, uh, and so uh, Arizona's got a pretty good model. Um, I believe Nevada might be the other state. Don't quote me on that one, but... Uh, um, we've been, been looking at those things, and um, so in those fatality and near fatalities, those are the ones we need to learn from, right? That's We, we don't want the uh, case like we had with Kennedy Miller ever again. We, we want to prevent those things, but we, we prevent those things when we learn the failures and the problems uh, that were uh, encountered in that case. So these uh, uh, near fatality or fatality reviews, I believe, are essential to it. Uh, to, to learning that, taking a, a closer look, kind of exactly what uh, Delegate Height said, you know, these things are done when people come together, solutions are created when we're all working together. So uh, really looking forward to like a review team that will um, bring some transparency um, and a better understanding when we have those fatalities and near fatalities. So, so that's one uh, uh, key piece here we're looking for. Um, just give you kind of a, another simple one for foster parents. So, Actually, before we move um, on, could you give an example of, for example, just drill a little deeper on that. What, for example, would did, would Arizona do that we're not doing in terms of uh, transparency with near fatalities? So uh, Arizona is putting everything up on a website. So they're doing an initial report. Um, within, I believe it's 30 days, and then they're doing follow-up reports and adding information to that report as it comes out, right? There's an investigation going on. We're learning more details. Things come out. Um, right now, West Virginia is waiting and uh, doing what I would consider a more of a vague annual report. And uh, so that's coming out later in the year. Doesn't have a lot of information. And, um, and so I think we need to be a little more thorough and, and while it's fresh. Right? And where's the friction point that keeps, I mean, that, that kind of seems like a no brainer to me. I mean, given the stakes. So where's the pushback coming from? Well, there's, there's kind of two different things here that you've got to uh, look at. So a near fatality, there are still things that need to be protected. That child is still a, a living human being and is a minor and uh, those, uh, her, his or her information uh, should be handled with confidentiality and protection. Um, and then in a fatality, some people claim that you can't release information um, based upon that you should protect that minor's rights and confidentiality. But really in, in my understanding, and as we've investigated and looked at other states, once there's a fatality, 
there's there's no longer i mean it, it's it's sad to say and, and it breaks my heart to even say it there's no longer a living child to protect and and so now at that point we can get a little bit more thorough and be a little more transparent um with that so it's almost like a confidentiality thing is is kind of the uh the 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 reason that folks are wanting to push back and say we can't do that and i don't believe necessarily that that's completely accurate but uh, we still have a fine line to follow um to make sure we're not uh, overstepping into uh, those confidentiality uh, issues but again um, let's learn from them prevent them and uh and make sure that uh, the kids aren't, aren't aren't dying yeah i think i think currently that there's this uh when there's a near near fatality or a fatality, there's this uh, attitude, you know, you know, a human response of, of CYA um, within the agencies, and uh, they don't want to release information. They want to do investigations, but they want to do it quietly behind the scenes until they, you know, so there aren't, there isn't everybody pointing fingers and, and assigning blame, um, and, and they sort of, I, I would say, try to run out the clock, you know, till you know, people move on to the next big thing, and you never really get to the bottom of what really happened in these cases. And I think what Adam is trying to do and his committee is trying to do is saying, you know, you need to, this information needs to become public. As much of it as possible needs to become public as soon as possible. Um, and other states are doing that. They're putting uh, this kind of information out on the websites, their websites, um, saying this is what we know so far and adding to it as they get more and more information um, so that it's a way to prevent these types of things from happening again in the future. That, that that's the, the ultimate goal is to say we're, we, we're not necessarily assigning blame, but these are the the things that happened that led to this and how do we prevent that from happening happening again and if you don't identify them and get them out there um, then it leads to the possibility of it happening again so um, you know the if nothing comes from this this poor, tragic child's fatality uh, that we've rec had recently um, hopefully there will be laws that change to make sure that it does doesn't happen again and, and I'll also add, um, there's a kind of a more of an inclusive investigation right now done through the Department of Human Services. And so what we want to do is we want to broaden that out to, to not just one agency doing this investigation. So this review team is going to have executive, legislative, and judicial folks on it. Everybody kind of looking at it from their own angle. Everybody plays a little bit of role in it. Um, and um, a lot of different stakeholders are going to be present on it. And I think that's key as well. Everybody looks at things different. And you, you've got to, and everybody's got different responsibilities. And so if you're letting one agency dictate um, how the investigation is going, they can sort of control the narrative and point the fingers at everybody else. But those folks weren't in the room to, to really um, dig into it. So. I think that's the other key thing is having the right people in the room doing the investigation. Yeah, and then and then there's another piece of legislation I believe we're working on that when when uh, a foster home or, or an agency or whatever receives a child uh, that that the 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 state has taken custody of of making sure that that whoever that child gets placed with has the immediate funds. To start taking care of that individual, that child. Do they have access to their medical records? Um, not totally right now. Okay. That, but that's one of those things that we're working on uh, right now. You know, if Adam gets a, a child, he doesn't he doesn't have immediate access to to medical records. He doesn't have immediate access to funds. You know, and he, he may get somebody at at eight ten o'clock in the evening. And the, if it's an infant, that child needs diapers, it needs formula, it needs all these different things. And that come, right now, that's coming out of Adam's pocket. That's coming out of an agency's pocket. That's coming out of somebody else's pocket until the state gets their act together to start reimbursing that. And, and that shouldn't be the way we, we so, react. Adam, maybe you can explain this better for me. I'm just a little confused. Yeah, so, so, the, um, so when we get a child uh, a call, they give us what they call a voucher. And uh, they'll, they'll call it kind of a clothing voucher, but it's for everything from clothing to a car seat to bottles, diapers, formula, all of that. So 
Um, you know, also remember, so your, your payment as a foster parent, you do get paid for those children in your care, but it comes after the fact. So if a, a child is in my and care... And the child's for, already gone to an agency before that, correct? I mean, it... Or, or are these no. children go directly to families sometimes? That's what yeah, I was confused. Yeah, go, go directly to families. So, okay. so in our case, we get a call. Uh, kids are at a hospital getting checked out on a wellness check. I go to the hospital. i got to pick them up. When I leave there with them, I've got to have everything from the car seat, you know, adequate car seats, diapers, wipes, all of that, so that I can get them safely uh, from the hospital to, to my home. And I don't get payment for them until later on. So they created this clothing voucher um, to, or, or what we would call a voucher to, to kind of fill that gap. And so a lot of times they'll give that to you when you pick up the child. Here's the issue we've ran into. Uh, they're issuing those vouchers for one store, and that's Gabriel Brothers. And so in, in north central West Virginia here, we, we have to drive over 30 minutes to, to the local Gabe's to see if they've got anything that will fit that $350 voucher for the kids that I'm in. I just find that to be quite unacceptable with, uh, with the needs of children, right? I can't get a car seat at Gabe's. I can't get bottles at, at Gabe's and, and all of those things. And so what I found out was the likes of Target and Walmart and some of those stores stopped accepting those vouchers because the state of West Virginia was not paying their bills in a timely fashion. And uh, so, so that's created this issue. So we're looking at creating a prepaid type debit credit card that will be issued uh, to the family where uh, with stipulations on it on what it can be used for so that they can go get the adequate things that they need to be able to, to care for that child. At the moment, the, the logistics of the example you said you go to the hospital the child's there for a wellness check and then you bring them home at that point you don't know if it's going to be a placement for that night or if it's going to be for two weeks or four months um very unknown uh, you're exactly right um Unbelievable. they give you what information they have um you can anticipate that child's probably going to be with you at least 30 days or so um because of, of getting you know they they've you know they've removed the child and they have um cause to do that but now it starts the court process and the legal process and so it, it's going to be 30 days or so before um, that process really gets gets rolling i believe you're supposed to have what they call a multidisciplinary team meeting within 30 days that, that kind of gets you a better understanding of it and but keep in mind uh, west virginia leads the nation in kinship care so that's grandmas aunts uncles neighbors anybody that's associated with the child. So you might get that call in the middle of the night, go get the child. They might go back and realize, hey, grandma lives three counties over and they do a quick background check. They do some work on here. So, so maybe two or three days later, they might remove that child and put it with, with grandma or what, what they would call a kinship placement. But, but uh, So what's the yeah, final backstop for know. this? If, <clears throat> if you're not available and you and, and people like you are not available to take it and there are no kinship, are, do, do we have orphanages? I know it's probably not a, the right term, but... Are, yeah, so we would call them group homes now, but, okay. but, but uh, is a politically correct uh, term. But, right. but, but you're, you're right in that, yeah. We would run into an issue where we would not be able to place kids. And so um, you would either have the group home uh, orphanage type uh, uh, placements begin to rise up, uh, again, right? You'd have to, to do that. Or you would have children living in unsafe circumstances because there wouldn't be a placement for them. So they, you'd have to leave them in a place that they were not safe, that they could be injured, could be hurt. Um, and so uh, that's the, the other extreme as well. If, if we Adam, don't have families, you're going to possibly harm children. Adam, do you know the percentage of children in our foster care that are from abusive families versus poverty is, is is it is it pretty even or is it is it mostly uh drug related well um a lot of it is drug related but i think we've got an issue in the state and we got about 60 we, seconds just so you know okay where we tried to be politically correct and so we're we we, we don't want to stigmatize uh drug abuse uh, substance use like we used to and so we're trying to um, 
take the negative spin off of that. And I don't think that's a good thing for us to do. Right. And, uh, and so that, that construes the data. So you're, you know, it's hard to dig through the data. Data is only as good as the source that it's coming from. And so I can't completely uh, answer that. So last plug I want to throw in there. Yeah. Everybody needs to go watch a new movie, Sound of Hope. It's from Angel Studios. It's about Possum Trot, Texas. Uh, 22 families in that community adopted 77 kids. Wow. And uh, I hope everybody can go watch What's the name of that movie, movie again? Sound of Hope. Same in, group in that did Sound of Hope. across West Virginia right now. Okay. Adam, thank and, you so uh, much for joining us. I know. You know, 30 minutes is definitely not enough to, to chat about this subject, but thank you for joining us. You are listening to WRNR and TV 10. We'll see you right after the break.